Gosh, there are a lot of people here. I see that a lot of us are mediating this experience through video. Um, I want to get the uh, formal part of the evening out of the way immediately, which is the part where you say good morning to my brother Hank. So if you could just, it's, it's, I realize that it's not currently Monday, but it will be Monday in the fullness of time, my friend. So if you could just say, uh, good morning, Hank, it's Monday on three, one, two, three. I cut the cheering, so you guys did all that for nothing, but thank you. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and, and I'm, uh, as always, happy to be in Pittsburgh and, and grateful uh, to Pittsburgh. I want to thank uh, the Pittsburgh uh, Arts and Lecture Series and the Carnegie Library. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. I particularly want to thank, uh, frankly, the best part of the evening has already happened. Um, <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed that, because uh, that was top class entertainment. Um, I want to thank Armored Bear Cub, uh, Lauren and Matt, who are so great and uh, write songs about, about books uh, in a way that reminds all of us uh, that, there is, that, that uh, there is great stuff to be made out of the great stuff that is made in this world. And I, I look up to uh, Lauren and Matt and so much, and I also want to thank uh, Siobhan, who's just amazing. Uh, if you can't tell from that introduction, she's a heck of a good writer. Um, and she lives right here in Pittsburgh, and her books are for sale uh, today. And uh, I, I really urge you uh, to check out her work, because she's amazing. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Um, Carrie O'Connor has been uh, driving me around all day today. I want to uh, thank her as well, and made all of this possible. There's a lot of people here. <laughs> So I'm going to try not to freak out, but uh, there are a lot of you. Uh, also, this isn't very funny, so just prepare yourselves for that. There will be a Q&A session, however, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that will be funny. All right, so um, I, I have this kid. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> 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 Kid. Um, he just turned one. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> so uh, my kid just turned one. Uh, he's really he's a really cool kid. His name is Henry. Um, but he seems to believe that he's actually and, and literally the only person who has ever existed in all of human history. Um, and, and he believes, I want you to look into his eyes and, and see how true this is. He believes that all other carbon-based life forms are robots, uh, <laughs> whose sole purpose of existence is to see that he gets whatever he wants at the precise moment he wants it. Uh, it's kind of like um, Henry doesn't understand that other people are, are people. I'm fascinated by this problem, partly because I think it's universal, and partly because if I could convince Henry of the value of empathy, he would be much less likely to wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so with that background, I want to talk a little bit today about why I write books and make videos. But first, uh, I want to tell you a story. And some of you have already heard this story. In fact, many of you have. Uh, so for you, I, uh, I give you Gary Busey family photo to look at for a while. <laughs> because that's funny. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> So just enjoy that while I tell the story. <laughs> so my friend, uh, my friend, I was living with my friend Hassan. This was in Chicago, uh, right during the first, um, in, in, the, the second invasion of Iraq. And my friend Hassan, his family lives on the uh, Kuwaiti border with Iraq in a little village. And uh, as soon as the uh, the war started, he lost all ability to communicate with his family. And he was really whiny about this. Um, he would never shut up about how he didn't know that if his family was safe or anything. And uh, and we we, we uh, his way of dealing with it was that he would watch CNN 24 hours a day. And I don't mean that he would watch CNN like 16 hours a day and then sleep eight hours a day. I mean he would watch CNN 20 four hours a day, and we only had one television, and there were four of us living in this place. And every now and again, we'd come, you know, down to the TV and we'd say, you know, Hassan, I am also concerned about your family, but I want to watch Friends. <laughs> and he would say, no, 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 we got to watch this. And I was like, Who, they're not going to report Hassan's family as well. Um, 
So the only way to hang out with Hassan or to watch TV in this apartment was to sit uh, on the couch that Hassan sat on and um, watch CNN with him. So one day I'm watching CNN with him, uh, and uh, they, they show some new footage. And it's one of those situations where new footage is coming in, and the anchor is looking at it for the first time, just like we're looking at it for the first time. But the anchor has a microphone, so what he says has authority. Um, and it's, uh, it's a picture of a house uh, with a huge uh, hole in one of the walls. It's clearly a bomb hole. And that, that people have put plywood over, and on that plywood is scrawled in very angry looking black Arabic graffiti. Oh, that's my, God. <laughs> Guys, you've gotta turn off your cameras. No, <laughs> it's always me. Now my phone's gonna ring. Um, on that wall is scrawled in very angry looking Arabic graffiti, something in black spray paint. And the guy on TV is talking about the, uh, the anger on the Arab street and the yada, yada, yada. And Hassan starts to laugh. And I said, what's so funny? And he said, the graffiti. I said, what's funny about it? He said, it says, happy birthday, sir, despite the circumstances. <laughs> uh, so clearly the problem of failing to apprehend the full and complete humanity of people other than oneself is not a problem uh, that is reserved solely for my son. Uh, it was as a direct result of that story, by the way, that I ended up writing my novel, An Abundance of Catherines, because I wanted to write about a regular Muslim kid living in America for whom being a Muslim is not finally that big of a deal. So my question to you tonight is how we come to believe that other people are as human as we are, that people far away from us have birthdays and real griefs and real joys. I believe that it is through story, that in fact that's why we invented story in the first place. When I was a teenager, it was stories like The Catcher in the Rye and The Bluest Eye and Fallen Angels that were so incontestably true and human that I could not deny the humanity that I shared with the people in those stories. And one of the funny things about reading, as opposed to, you know, living, is that when you're living, you see everyone in the context of you, right? So your best friend is your best friend. Your girlfriend is your girlfriend. You don't see people in the context of themselves. But one of the magical things about reading is that you do come to see people in the context of themselves. You stop being you all the time, and you become Holden Caulfield in a way that you can't become your best friend or your sister or your parents or anyone. When I'm writing, I want to reveal the inner life of the people I'm writing about. I don't want my readers to feel like, I, want my readers, I don't want my readers to feel like they know Pudge, or they know Alaska, or Hassan, or Colin, or Q, or Margo, or Tiny Cooper. I want them to feel that they have seen for a moment what it is like to be those people. And the reason I think books are so well positioned to do this is because they are more than any other art form a co-creation between the reader and the writer. Like, I just got uh, the Chinese edition of all three of my books. They published them simultaneously uh, in mainland China, and they sent me all three of them. Uh, and I, I wrote these books. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time on them. I know about what happens in them. I remember, not, if not necessarily, oh, hi, Gary Busey. Um, if not necessarily, oh, by the way, we're going to get to him. Um, I don't necessarily remember all the words in them, but I remember, you know, a lot of what happens in, in the books that I wrote. And I got these three books um, in Chinese. And I started paging through them, and I realized that not only was I not able to, to read the, these books, I didn't know which was which. <laughs> you know? Like, I, it took me forever. Finally, I just took a picture of the cover of one of them, and I, I, uh, I emailed it to some, some people I know who speak Chinese, and I was like, which one is this? <laughs> and they wrote back, and they were like, I think looking for Alaska, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is that I can't crack the code of Chinese, but I can crack the code of English. So, I mean, essentially, this is just meaningless scratches on, on a page until you interpret it, until you take it and make it real in your mind. And that, that to me is the absolute